Los moros que trajo Franco en Madrid quieren entrar Mientras quieren milicianos los moros no pasarán Mientras quieren milicianos los moros no pasarán no pasará, no pasará. Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you all with us once again. And what you just heard was no pasarán. They shall not pass is what it means in English. It became the unofficial anthem of the forces fighting the fascists in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. It was written following the great revolutionary leader Dolores Ibarruri Gómez's speech, No Pasaran, that she made on July 18, 1936. And while the fascists won under Franco with the support of Hitler and Mussolini in 1939, that led to 36 years of brutal right-wing dictatorship in Spain, we find Spain now gripped in a struggle between the right and the left again, between the forces of right authoritarianism and those on the left and others wanting a freer society. In Spain's election last month, the fascist party, Partido Popular, won the most votes. Not a majority, but the most votes. But the nation and the electoral count show a country deeply, deeply divided. The king of Spain even tried to anoint the right wing, and they didn't have the votes to get it done. So we're taping this together on, on September the 26th. And so let me introduce our guests. These two gentlemen wrote an article in The Nation about the Spanish election, uh, and uh, they join me here today. And in the studio is Bekar Stegwin, who is assistant professor of Iberian Studies at Johns Hopkins University. His new book is the op-ed novel, A Literary History of Post-Franco Spain. And Sebastian Faber, who is professor of Hispanic Studies at Oberlin College. An updated version of his book, Exhuming Franco, Spain's Second Transition, will be published in November. And gentlemen, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, in my best Spanish... So new, what's happening in Spain? <laughs> it's, it, it's so it, it seems that when we're taping this today, that the Spanish election took place and that it's still undecided who's going to form this government. So take us back a couple of steps to this election um, and, and its significance, how it happened, and, and what is playing out here. So essentially, the the kind of uh, early, or sorry, uh, uh, recent prehistory of this election takes us back to May. Uh, in late May, there was a local and municipal elections. So Spain essentially has two kind of two cycles of elections. There are kind of uh, there are other elections that are uh, kind of interspersed throughout. But the two cycles are you have local regional elections every four years, and then you have the national elections. And uh, uh, the local le and regional elections took place in late May, and the left lost uh, pretty considerably. Uh, both the kind of center left, the Partido Socialista Obrero Español, the PSOE, as it's often referred to. PSOE. Uh, PSOE, exactly. Just for those who don't speak Spanish. Exactly. <laughs> and and also uh, Podemos, which was the left wing party that that came uh, came on the scene in 2015, um, and almost or has had let's say lots of electoral success early on, um, but that has been tapering off since 2019. And so the left lost pretty dramatically. And some of those losses were less in terms of the amount of votes that they received and more in terms of the kind of fracturing of the left, right? There were kind of internal left divisions that led- uh, How left, odd. Uh, le exactly, <laughs> right. That led uh, kind of different left-wing parties in different communities to kind of split the vote share and not reach the threshold in order to be able to enter the, the, the regional parliaments. And then the day after uh, those local and municipal elections on, uh, in May, uh, Pedro Sanchez, the, the president of the government, called snap general elections. And those elections uh, took place, I mean, weeks later, basically less two months later, uh, or not even two months later. Um, and and this was a this was I think it took most of us by surprise because the left was kind of wounded. It was uh, it didn't really have a kind of clear message, right? There were kind of parts of the left that wanted to focus more on labor. People like Yolanda Diaz, uh, the the minister of labor under Pedro Sanchez, who is of the Podemos uh, group. She's also of Izquierda Unida, the kind of left uh, wing party where the Com Spanish Communist Party uh, forms part of that coalition. Um, but then there were other people, others on the left that wanted to focus more on cultural politics. Um, and I think that kind of divided the left in a sense. And then you have the kind of center left, which 
<laughs> doesn't really often decide or can't really decide whether it's with uh, labor or whether it's with kind of capital, right? Um, and then we had the elections in, in July and Pedro Sanchez, despite, let's say, uh, calling these elections and everyone thinking that it was also going to be a catastrophe, just like the May elections in these national elections, Pedro Sanchez actually stood firm and uh, and got enough votes together with uh, the independence parties, uh, pro-independence parties in Catalonia and the Basque Country, uh, and the left-wing party got enough uh, uh, representatives so that people think today, or in a couple months, the Socialist Party will be able to form a government after this whole uh, debate with with the conservative uh, uh, party is happening right now in Congress. So, Sebastian, I, I, one of the things I, I, I want to kind of lay out here and maybe help us with this is that a <clears throat> we I do this series here at the Real News on the rise of the right, and clearly this is a battle that is at the heart of that and the heart of that in Europe. So. Why is this election so important, A, for both the European Union and Europe, what, it's, what, what it could portend, especially given the right-wing government in Italy and other places around Europe and the surge of the right in Europe, uh, and, and why, we should, why, why the universal we should even care about it? That's a great question. Um, as Becker was saying, the, um, the big question in the elections in July was, will the combined right within a vote to form a government? And the combined right is the, the party that likes to see itself as center right, the Partido Popular, the PP, um, and the far right, which is a young party called Vox, which is of a kind really of the, it's very much like, roughly like the far right in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in, uh, in other European countries. And at a European level, the big moral and political question faced by center right parties in Germany, in Holland, in France, is are we willing to ally ourselves with the far right in order to form a government? In um, so that's the whole debate about the um, what they call the the the, the uh, quarantining of the far right or letting them into spaces of government. Um, the Spanish Partido Popular has long been, or well, since since Vox has appeared on the scene, Vox, which by the way was a breakaway party from the Pepe itself. It's founded by members of the Pepe, um, indicating that for a long time, the center-right Pepe was a welcome home for far people with far-right ideas. At one point, they broke away, they formed their own party. Um, some people say that that happened in part to re-engage uh, the far-right vote. They thought, they thought it, was, it makes more sense to have a separate far-right party to get those people out to the polls. and increase the share of the right-wing vote in total. But the Pepe has been wishy-washy. Sometimes they say, we will never ally ourselves with the far right. Sometimes they say, they, we do. The key thing that happened between the two elections that Becker referenced, between the elections in May, which were um, at the city level and at the regional level, and the national elections, what was at the regional and city level, the Pepe turned out to have no qualms whatsoever to ally themselves with the far right book. So that currently, a bunch of Spain's regional governments and hundreds of municipal governments are governed by the far right in combination with the center right, in which the far right has almost an open field in terms of its most radical policies. Mm -hmm. And that scared voters enough, apparently, to shore up the vote on the left and make it just impossible for the far right and the center right to form a government. So this is very complex, but let, let me ask one quick thing first, because people don't, don't know it, nor they, would, would they know what all these names means. When you say Pepe, what's the name of the party? The Popular Party, the Partido Popular. Okay, so, so just for folks to know, about the, and that, that's, the, that's the, the larger kind of right-wing conservative party, Vox being the far-right party. Exactly. VOX. exactly. Um, so so I, I'm very curious as to your perspective on, before we come back to why this is so important to the European Union and why it's so important to the world, the, the roots of the, of the depth of the divide in Spain, between right and left, and all the kind of because it's also kind of um, wrapped up in the independence movements and the the, the in, in the in the in the among Basques and among the Catalan in Catalan where people feel that they really aren't Spanish and they're somewhere they need to be free and independent, which is a piece of this pie. So it's a very complex situation. So let's talk a bit about that and and why why would they why would they 
right win so powerfully in these local elections, but now be set up where they might lose the national election very closely to the left. So it's, it's, so it's a really complex thing. But which one of you wants to go first? Sebastian, you can go ahead. Sebastian? Okay, I'll, I'll, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab and I'll let you take over, Rebecca. Okay, good. Um, go ahead. Stab away. So <laughs> the, the, the division, division between left and right in Spain has been very important throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And, and the Spanish Civil War, which is looms large in, in American imagination of Spain, in the 1930s. also was the division between the left and the right. Um, in, it, in, in most countries, the left and the right differ on, on economic policies, the, the, the role they, they give to the working class, how they think about taxes and social rights and minority rights, all those things. In Spain, on top of that, there's a big clash between two competing visions of what Spain really is. So some people see Spain as a collection of different national identities that form one state together. And some people see that collection of national identities as a threat to the future and identity of Spain. And the current left-right divide um, is in large part that same division where the, the, the center-right and the far-right have a high, very hard time with the idea that Spain is a multinational state with different populations speaking different languages or thinking of themselves in terms of different identities. Versus the left, which is has been much more welcoming to that idea. There's plenty of people on the left who are iffy about it too, but yep. overall, the left has been willing to do that. And in the past five years, as a progressive coalition has governed Spain, that openness to that idea has manifested in the fact that nationalist parties from Catalonia, from Catalonia and the Basque Country have given have given parliamentary support to the coalition government. If the coalition government, the left-wing coalition government manages to renew itself in the coming weeks, manages to form a new government again, it will have to be again with the support of the Basques and the Catalans. Um, and that to the right, in of, in and of itself, is a mark of illegitimacy. They say, if the Spanish national government becomes a national government with the support of people who want to break up Spain, quote unquote, then that is an illegitimate government. So the debate has in part been so intense because it's not only who gets to govern, um, the arguments being uh, wielded go to the heart of the legitimacy of Spanish democracy and the legitimacy of a government that may govern with the majority of votes in parliament, but those votes are being called into question in and of themselves because the right says, well, if a Basque nationalist party supports the national government of Spain, that's not proper support. That's undermining hmm. Spain. That's that's breaking Spain Spain apart. Here we have terrorists on the side of the of the prime minister. That's the end of the world, basically. So that's that, that, so the whole idea of what Spain represents is key. For the right, on the other hand, their their inability to acknowledge the multinational nature of Spain means that it's very hard for them to get votes in Catalonia and the Basque Country, which are two very rich and populated regions. So it's also kind of a glass ceiling to the right's ability to grow as long as they cannot come to terms with the reality that many Basques feel as Basque as Spanish or more Basque than Spanish. Many Catalans the same way. And also, if you take it back to the Spanish Civil War, the people in Catalan and the Basque Country fought against the fascists in the Civil War in 1930s, they gave the right wing its power with Franco, which is another complex thing. We don't get, get too deep into the 1930s, but it, it, it's important. So what is this, do you think this is portends? I mean, if, 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 if Spain cannot form a government, or if it does form a government, and you have the Basque and, Cat and, and Catalan parties uh, in it, some of whom want independence, especially in Catalan, who want independence, but they are gonna support the left, so, I mean, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think that, what do you think, A, that, again, I'm going to go back to the original question I said, where that takes Spain, but what does it say about Europe and what we're facing in the future? I, th I think in terms of Spain, I think uh, it, this is nothing new, is what I would say. Right. <laughs> the, the, Spain has been dealing with this uh, essentially since 1978, since the Spanish constitution, uh, the most recent Spanish constitution uh, wa was codified. Three years after the fascist Franco died. Exactly. Right. And so 
during the during the transition to democracy, during which the Constitution was was codified, um, there was this kind of hodgepodge attempt to create uh, a federal system like we have in the United States. And now I say hodgepodge because it's Spain's system is quasi federal. It's not exactly federal, and it's quasi federal because there are, it's still a very centralized state in certain respects, but it has a Senate that, as we saw in 2017, has the power to vote. Uh, in favor of the Spanish national government taking over the powers that, ha that, that have been given to the Catalan regional government or the Basque regional government, et cetera. Um, and so what, what I would say is that, that historically, Spain has been able to deal with this, even, even despite having a, an incomplete federal system where not all of the regions have equal power. You have some regions that have more competencies in terms of their finances, in terms of what they are able to, to build, in terms of what they are able to import, export, et cetera. Um, and you have some regions that have, have less competencies. But in terms of the Spanish right, what's interesting to me is that, of course, the Spanish right has also relied historically on the support of uh, nationalist parties in Catalonia and the Basque, Basque country. José María Aznar, in 1996, uh, was voted into power, and Felipe Sánchez was... Uh, Felipe, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> um, the, uh, Felipe González, the, the, the then prime minister of Spain, was voted out of power precisely on the support of the right-wing Catalans and the right-wing uh, Basque national parties. So this is because this can get into the weeds and people go, what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I mean, so, so, so the, the, the complexity of this for a moment, I just want to wrestle with before we move into what is about to happen is that the, the Catalans and the Basque both who see themselves as not necessarily Spanish, but as their own national identity, not to mention Andalusians and the rest, we won't get into that today, but <laughs> see their, so their own identity are also divided politically between right and left. Yes. Right. Yes. Exactly. They are. They are both divided between right and left, and this often falls along class lines. Just with the Partido Popular, where you have many supporters of the Parti, Partido Popular, especially in cities like Madrid, that come from the bourgeoisie, that come from the established kind of elites. Uh, and the same is true in in the Basque country and in Catalonia. You have the PNV, the Partido Nacionalista Vasco, right, the Nationalist Basque Party. Uh, and you have a, an old party in, in Catalonia that was called Convergencia y Unión, which was the kind of center-right uh, nationalist Catalan party. And both of those parties supported, have supported off and on uh, the right-wing party, the Partido Popular, the PP. And so, of course, the support can go either can go both ways. And I think in the what has kind of shifted maybe in the past 15 years or so is that there has been, especially in Catalonia, a more concerted effort to... Um, to assert um, that national identity through a referendum. And the referendum is really the kind of symbol for the right of everything that is wrong with Spain, right? They, they again, this, this happened before the Scottish independence referendum in 2014, um, but the, the, the Catalan right essentially became much more pro-referendum, whereas before, let's say around uh, 2011, the Catalan right was far more pro-negotiation. They wanted to negotiate. And the, the Basque Nationalist Party, I would say, even to this day, is still pro-negotiation. They haven't really asked for a referendum in the same way that, um, that the Catalan right has. And that referendum is really the kind of wedge issue for, for many in Spain, where people on the right, people who have more conservative beliefs about, about Spain and Spanish nationalism, absolutely reject that idea. And then people on the left maybe are more open to the idea of having a referendum similar to the way that Scotland had their referendum. Sebastian, you look like you're about to jump in and say something, are you? Oh, no, I mean, <laughs> you're right that it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, so out of what Becker just explained, one question that, that could arise is like, why have the right-wing parties in these two regions, in the Basque Party and in Catalonia, jumped onto the referendum bandwagon, right? What, what is what motivated these conservative parties to become pro-independence or pro-self-determination? And one answer to that question um, is that uh, basically it was good for them electorally. The, there was a, a, a real rise of, um, of indignation in the Basque country and in Catalonia in the face of what they saw as contempt from Madrid for their aspirations and their identity. 
And the, the, the government of the conservative prime minister, Mariano Rajoy, which was also from the popular party, uh, really did a lot of work there to turn Catalonia and the Basque country against Madrid. So, for example, when Catalonia tried to negotiate, successfully negotiated a redefinition of its statute of autonomy for its region, um, in which it, it gained the right to call itself a nation, not just a nationality, Rajoy then responded with a, a, a boycott of Catalan products and cultural figures. So the, the right was right wing in Madrid was saying like, let's all stop buying Catalan champagne, Cava, and let's all stop watching Barcelona play soccer, right? So that really increased the feeling in Catalonia. It's like, wait a second, we don't want to be part of this kind of Spain. And the Catalan right party, which is having a tough time because these were times of austerity. The Catalan right had been cutting hospitals and social services and education. They're like, wait a second, we can jump on this on this referendum bandwagon and reconstitute our electoral base. And they did. So that's really how the, the right left-wing coalition around the notion of self-definition really ballooned and led to the 2017 referendum and this massive violent cl um, clash between uh, Madrid, which sent in police forces to, to prevent citizens from voting, and then, as as Vega explained, the Spanish Senate, which said, we're going to take away your regional self-government as a punishment for you having this illegal referendum for independence. And, and so the crux of the situation right now is that essentially, as Sebastian was saying, both sides, both, let's say, right wing or center right Catalan nationalists and Basque nationalists to, to a lesser extent, as well as right wing Spanish nationalists, the Partido Popular, both of these signs gain electorally from stoking the flames of nationalism, Spanish nationalism on the on the conservative Spanish side and Catalan and Basque nationalism on the kind of conservative, uh, uh, let's say, internal nations side, right, in Catalonia and the Basque country. And so that's the crux of the matter now. And in fact, that is uh, seeping into the the current debate over uh, whether Mariana, uh, whether uh, Pedro Sanchez's government is going to give amnesty to uh, the political prisoners, the people who were exiled, uh, but also the people who were jailed. Um, whether Pedro Sanchez is going to continue to give political amnesty to to the Catalan uh, 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 to the Catalan politicians who attempted to to carry out this referendum and, and establish independence. Well, for this part of our conversation, I'm, I'm curious just just to kind of ask you both now, A, what you think the future holds for Spain, given the given the the coalition on the left, which is very fractious, and if it can hold itself together, which way the Basque and Cat Catalan will go, right or left, and inside the who's coalition government. Um, and the thing I asked earlier, why should we care? If you're not in Spain, why should you care? I mean, what, what exactly, and because it seems to me, we don't understand the gravity of the situation outside of there, nor its importance. So, so go ahead. Why don't you begin with Car and then with Sebastian? From the sure. So, I think I think we should care because there are certain interesting parallels in terms of political polarization between uh, between Spain and the United States. In the United States, maybe it's a, a kind of a, a cartoonish way to describe it, but in the United States, it seems almost more divided between. Uh, right and left, but underneath the surface, you can also see regional divisions in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think those regional divisions between north and south, between coasts um, and, and the interior, right, those kinds of regional divisions don't map on exactly, but they are regional divides in ways that I don't think that we're understanding. But yet, in the Spanish context, they almost have to be politicized explicitly because these are debates that happen in the parliament, right? You have parties that essentially represent not only the regional difference, but the ideological difference within that regional difference. And so I think seeing those intersections and how they're actually functioning, right, either to destabilize a parliament or to form a coalition, right? So for example, right now, what's interesting um, in the Spanish case is that essentially the, the Catalan center-right, the pro-independent uh, center-right, has uh, decided that at least for now, we'll see what happens over the next next couple months, but that it is not going to put up a huge roadblock, an insurmountable roadblock to Pedro Sanchez forming a government. Whereas many people, maybe before the elect this electoral cycle, uh, might have thought that the Catalan right, in fact, wanted to really stoke those flames of Catalan nationalism and anti-Catalan nationalist sentiment in order to 
to gain electorally and would provide a huge roadblock to the centrist government. And maybe the centrist government wouldn't be able to to form at all. And so it's what I think is, is again, these these kind of regional differences mixed with these ideological differences are really the kind of parallel that you can see, for example, between the United States and Spain. And that that's why it would be important to kind of consider what is going on in Spain right now, because things are just more explicit. Mm -hmm. Bastian? I think I, I would add two two notes to the great things that Bechert just said. One is that um, a shift in government in Spain, a, a potential right-wing government in Spain, would really impact the balance in Brussels. So for the EU, which is facing its own elections next year, um, it will be a big question whether the right, far-right coalition will um, gain power at the European Union level, and that would be uh, a huge shift. The other thing going, connecting with, with Rebecca said about the connections with the United States, I think one huge thing to lesson to learn from Spain is um, whether it makes sense to try to fight the right with culture wars. What does that mean? Uh, what I mean by that is, um, so in, in Spain, um, the current left-wing government that's been governing for, 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 um, for four years um, has made huge inroads in, in social economic policies. They raised the minimum wage. They got the country through the COVID crisis with massive furlough as opposed to people just losing their jobs. So there's been a huge investment in the social safety network. Um, uh, at the same time that it's really tried to gain battles in terms of gender rights, um, a sexual consent law, um, uh, th th those kinds of things that the right really likes to rally around. The right has grabbed onto those things, the sexual consent law and uh, gender uh, identity to try to attack the left. Um, as a result, what you now see um, in the regions and towns where the right has just re risen to government thanks to these regional elections in May, among the first things they do is uh, things like take away all the bike paths. Like the left, previous left-wing government, its city level had made bike paths and tried to reduce car traffic. And the right is going like, we're going to get rid of the bike paths and paint them over. And we're going to, and the left had started building a monument to commemorate those who, the victims of the Franco regime. And it was like, we're going to destroy that monument or make it different. So the right really is trying to, uh, to fight its, to win electoral votes through culture wars because they know that they cannot fight the left on its successful economic policies, right? But so the question for the left is like, do we let ourselves be tempted into these kind of, into the battlefield that the right is bound to win? Or do we contain, do we, do we resist that temptation? And go, no, no, we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing, like shoring up minority rights, and at the same time, support labor, raise the minimum wage, reduce income inequality, and uh, work on inheritance tax that the right wants to abolish, um, and institute more progressive tax systems, things like that. So uh, very quickly here, um, before we conclude um, this portion of our conversation, if I was listening to this, one of the questions I would have in my head, if I would follow this at all, is if the left government in Spain under Sanchez did so many positive things for the lives of normal Spanish, Spanish people, as it was just outlined by, by Sebastian, then why are they in trouble? What, why? I mean, it's like if, if, they, if they're making life better for the mass of citizens, why is the ideological divide so deep that they're in such trouble, losing the municipal elections, and now on the verge perhaps of losing this national election? If they do, it's still a very divided country. So what do you? What is that? Give us a very quick analysis on that. So, so I think that the the most recent two national elections that Pedro Sanchez won are very peculiar. So he won a, a national ele election back in uh, twenty nineteen, right before the COVID crisis. The government was formed in January, and that had a very low voter turnout. And it was because Ra San Sanchez essentially ran a kind of negative campaign. Right, don't vote for these people. Right, vote for me as a vote against. The conservatives. Vox was on the rise at that point. They got a huge amount of the vote. 
um, and the PP was very was kind of coming on strong after the corruption scandal that led its government to fall the previous year. Um, and so he did a very similar thing uh, in this region, er, in this most recent national election. Right, this was a national election held during the summer. The voter share was not, or sorry, the voter turnout was not as low as people anticipated, but it was still relatively low. And yet he won again on this negative message. And I think that. Sanchez is comfortable on that ground. He's comfortable ren running a campaign saying, don't vote for the far right, don't vote for the center right because they're in bed with the far right. But he's not so comfortable, uh, let's say, on a more positive ground saying, these are my accomplishments, look at what I've done, look at the, the social welfare state that I'm kind of rebuilding after a decade of mismanagement and, and kind of disaster at the hands of Mariano Rajoy and the conservatives. Um, and so I think that he's just, the and he, Maybe Sanchez is a kind of symbol of this, symbol of the, the kind of broader, not only the center left, but even the the, the left wing in general, uh, in that the, the Spanish left hasn't really found a way to articulate positive positively what it has done. Because as Sebastián mentioned, it has made really incredible strides. Um, there's a lot to lot of uh, 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 things to be done, but they, they've they've made quite uh, quite important inroads. But yet they can't really articulate the impact on on regular people. Um, and I think that finding that is also a message to the American left, which the American left, as we saw in 2016 and again in 2020, is it finds it very difficult to run, let's say, it finds it very easy to run against someone like Donald Trump, but it finds it very difficult to run in favor, supporting certain policies and certain uh, ambitions and, and goals. So my, my last thought, Sebastian, very quickly, is, 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 is that's almost counterintuitive. <laughs> I mean, you build a... You build a place where it's more equitable for the mass of people to live right. and you don't fight for those things and say that's why we should win. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, as, as Becker said, um, there's a real discomfort in the center left, which has since the neoliberal, since the third way 80s has been, feel, just like the Democratic Party in the US has felt quite close to corporate elites and yeah, yeah. quite hesitant to embrace more radical economic policies. At the same time, just that, just like in the U.S., we shouldn't estimate, underestimate the power of the media. So in, in Spain, the media, even more than in the U.S., I would say, are are um, in majority in right wing hands, in 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 in, mm. in corporate hands, and um, that has allowed particular things to be blown out of proportion. I'll, I'll give one example: the squatter crisis. So in the months leading up to the election the regional election especially, and the municipal election, the right-wing media managed to create a problem out of nowhere. They, they said, if you leave your house for the weekend or to go shopping, likely squatters will come and take your house away from you. And because of these left-wing policies, nothing there's nothing you can do about it. You'll have lost your house, right? Statistics prove that this is a very tiny problem. It's not, it's not a big deal. It's really that, but it was blown out of proportion, kind of in part by sponsorship from companies that specialize in home security systems. And so it's there's <laughs> things like that. And the other the other big thing that that really did harm the left was that despite all its relative economic success, um, inflation was a huge deal in Spain, especially daily subsistence, like olive oil, uh, bread, potatoes. So it's the, the prices in the supermarkets had risen rose so much that, in people's day-to-day -day lives, they really had a sense like things are not going well right now because look at how much I've just spent on all my groceries. This has been a fascinating conversation. And I guess, uh, and um, I want to thank you both for taking your time today here on The Real News, The Mark Steiner Show. Um, you just have Sebastian Faber and Bekir Seguin who've joined us. And uh, we'll continue to take a look at Spain. And we really appreciate the work you do and for being part of the conversation today. Thank you. My pleasure. And I thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And I want to thank our guest, Sebastian Faber, professor of Hispanic studies at Oberlin. His latest book is Exhuming Franco. And Becker Seguin, who is an assistant professor of Iberian studies at Johns Hopkins University. His latest book is The Op-Ed Novel. And of course, thanks to David Hebden, Cameron Grandino, and Keller Rivera behind the scenes, and everyone here at The Real News for making this show possible. And let me know what you thought about what you heard today. Tell me what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I'll get right back to you. And while you're there, take a second. Go to 
www.therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly donor. So for Cameron Grandino, David Hebden, Kelly Rivera, the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.